Hey, well, welcome everybody. Uh, it's really exciting to be here uh, at the Melbourne Climate Futures Academy. Um, my name is Dr. Adam Bumpus. I'm the facilitator here today. Uh, and uh, before we start, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional lands on which we are meeting today, wherever we might be as we're on a virtual uh, call, but acknowledge the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And um, that is a really important statement for what we're talking about today, because we are talking about massive industrial transitions, massive societal transitions, things that uh, the society that we're in right now hasn't seen before. And, and societies such as the Indigenous society that's been here for 60,000 years have seen huge changes. And so I think there's a lot of importance that we can bring from that knowledge into what we're talking about today. So um, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Uh, with Liz Boylan, uh, Director of Energy Transitions at Deloitte, Rebecca Burden, CEO at Climate Resource, and Michael Charge, CEO at Senversa, uh, to talk about what the, the challenge of, uh, of the green transition and the climate transition looks like for industry and the challenges industry are facing, uh, and also to understand what it means to actually work in that environment and to actually be part of this transition, actually do the work on the ground every day trying to make this happen. So um, I hope that you can think about some questions. The format for today is we're going to have five minutes each from our panelists uh, to start with. Then we're going to have a facilitated discussion uh, on how the kind of issues that we're facing here, and then love to open up to Q&A to the audience. And so please put your uh, questions into the Q&A um, uh, Q tab and uh, look forward to the discussion. So I'll hand over to who's top of my left here is Liz. Um, Liz, five minutes, take it away and um, look forward to hearing from you. Great, thanks so much, Adam. And, and hi, everyone, thanks for joining. Um, my name's Liz Boylan, as, as Adam mentioned, I work at uh, Deloitte in the Melbourne office, um, part of a energy and climate team, uh, 70 of us nationwide, and, and we work on lots of different different projects for different types of clients. Um, yeah, very much on that sort of national basis. Um, so I guess Adam has given us a, a few questions to, to answer as part of our introduction. So. Um, the first one being um, how I got to this point in my career in two minutes or less. Um, I'll try and keep it even shorter than that. Um, so I um, uh, worked as a lawyer in the federal government for 10 years doing international uh, criminal legal work and then uh, environmental and energy law and policy. Um, I I guess I got into energy markets sort of seriously about six years ago. Um, which was uh, through the, um, the sort of Hazelwood uh, electricity and, and gas crises that, that happened at that point. And um, I guess I, I could see that there's this really interesting and challenging um, interaction between, you know, how we transition our, our energy markets and also, you know, work towards decarbonising our economy at the same time. And that was kind of the thing that really inspired me to, to get into um, energy and, and climate work and, and also, um, I guess, move out of government. Um, I think yeah, 10 years was enough for me. Um, so it was good to, yeah, to get out and, and work for a really broad range of clients who are all facing different but uh, common challenges um, and, you know, and to be able to, to get those insights into all different businesses is a, and, and work with government is, um, is a really interesting place to be. Um, we so yeah, Deloitte has a lot of different um, offerings and roles in in climate. Um, you know, we help with like risk and reporting um, obligations for for different companies. Um, we help uh, model like least cost abatement curves. Um, as mentioned, I'm sort of very much in the energy kind of section of of the the climate um, work that we do. Um, but yeah, because I, I would say like very very varied and many kind of um, linkages to different different offerings and, and types of clients like um, across the business. So I think, and it's a real kind of priority in terms of the work for Deloitte. Um, you know, we've set up sort of um, specialised um, groups to, to help sort of deal with it and bring together all of those different offerings in trying to address the challenges. Um, also, interestingly, as part of our um, our own decarbonisation journey, we're actually um, purchased a couple of, um, of, I think now three properties through Australia, um, where we're actually going to sort of drive and generate our own offsets instead of um, purchasing on the open market. So 
um, yeah, I think, and you might have seen this ads around Melbourne um, on the bus shelters about um, about that. So um, I guess moving to why I get up in the morning to do this work, um, I think it's yeah really fascinating. Like just an incredible kind of confluence of challenges requiring lots of um, varied skills to, to even get close to trying to solve the problem. And I think as we'll probably touch on later in the group, you know, there is just so much going on and, and it, it can feel a bit overwhelming at times in terms of the, the, the gravity and the complexity of the challenges. Um, but that I guess that's also what sort of makes it interesting and exciting. Um, and I would say sort of the people working in this space are generally you know, they're purpose driven, um, they are interesting, you know, come from really varied backgrounds. Um, so yeah, I would say on the whole, generally really great to work with. Um, Adam also asked us to touch on what's uh, a challenge in terms of, of the work. And I think, um, yeah, that's very much kind of the, the you know, the, the changing nature of, of the challenge. Um, it, sometimes it can feel kind of um, overwhelming or, too difficult to, to chip away at um, and that's where I think you know as as um, as professionals in this space you know it is important to not try and um, you know eat the whole apple all at once but to to just sort of focus on you know the the challenge in front of you at, at that point in time so you know trying to help that client with that problem um, uh, is kind of you know all we can do um, and it is, I think that's something I've, I've learned from working in this space is, you know, you can't keep across every single policy announcement or investment decision or, um, you know, I guess nuance in, in a, um, a company's position. Like it's just, there's just so much happening. So it's being able to operate in that sort of like fluid, flexible, um, constantly changing environment, I would say, so is a challenge, but also kind of the key to, to success and maintaining sanity. Maintaining sanity. That's a great, uh, that's a great one. I mean, that's, yeah, it, we'll come, we'll dive into this a bit later, Liz, but yeah, you're absolutely right. It's a really nice one to think through um, as a kind of challenge that we all face every day being in the space. It's complex. So um, brilliant. Thank you, Liz. Bang on time. Uh, maybe I'll switch, go to Michael and then we'll jump to Rebecca. Thanks, Adam and, and Liz. Um, yeah, I guess um, my story of how I got to where I am uh, goes back actually to the University of Melbourne about 30 years ago when I was a, a budding earth sciences uh, student and um, spending a lot of time at the Clyde Hotel. Um, but it was a really great, great grounding for me really to, um, to get into what at that time was a really fledgling uh, environmental consulting industry. There wasn't the array of of environmental courses and an offering that that um, is now available. Um, so my my traditional science background um, ended up uh, evolving into cleaning up service stations in Melbourne um, um, back in the in the 90s and and over time that's um, gone into the broader contaminated land route so which is still a huge part of of environmental consulting in general today um, I guess um, that grounding really is about, you know, managing projects. Then, then led me to kind of start to manage teams of people, and then, then ultimately, um, sort of go into into the management of organisations. So, so that's how I, I ended up uh, down the track where I am now. So, um, I guess, I guess my role really is to support um, teams of people that are that are out there delivering um, solutions. So at Sanversa, where I work, um, our our role really is to to help um, clients solve, you know, helping helping support clients uh, by solving their problems, and that that might be through uh, meeting their obligations um, or you know understanding their challenges, and 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 largely it's through trusted relationships is how it works on on the ground. So you build relationships with with clients, and you help help support their issues and. I guess uh, the question, why do we get up in the morning to do this type of work? I, I think for me, it's really, um, it's great people um, that you work with, um, diverse, amazing um, people that, you know, honestly astound me in terms of the the ideas and the thinking and the knowledge that, that comes together. And that then goes through to great projects. So we're actually delivering, you know, and working on, on some of the, the real challenges out there multidisciplinary 
And hopefully at the end of that, it's the great solutions or outcomes. So, so they're the kind of the three, the three great things that, that inspire me, the people, the projects and, and the outcomes. Um, and I think Adam, you asked, uh, what, is there anything that, you know, um, that um, is a challenging thing? And I, I think for me personally, uh, you know, it's coming to the conclusion that, that you can't be an expert on everything in this field. Um, you have to know your limits. Um, you have to rely on other people. And ultimately, you have to focus on where, where you as an individual can add the best value. So, yeah, that's, that's me in a nutshell. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, great. Uh, the well, uh, full disclosure, I work at Simverse as well with Michael, but he's, you know, there's it's not talking about me necessarily in that context. So there's so many, uh, you know, amazing people um, around in this, but I really like what you both said about the diversity of the kind of groups of people that we're working with. It's fascinating in this as a reason why we're kind of up in the middle, in the daytime to go and do this work and in the night. Um, thanks, Michael. Um, Rebecca, could you, yeah, give us your, um, your bio, please. Thanks, Adam. Yes, um, my bio. So I um, just would like to start by saying I'm joining from Nam, Melbourne. Um, as probably many of us are, given the connection to the University of Melbourne. Um, and uh, I'd like to pay my respects as well to the traditional owners of the land on which I'm joining, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, so my journey through climate change in my career has been a bit more circuitous than um, Liz and Michael's. Um, I first began working on climate change and responses to climate risk about 20 years ago. Um, but I've done a, a, a few um, off-piece things in the in the intervening period. So I'll take you on that journey a little bit. Um, I'm an economist by background and my first job out of um, university in New Zealand was at the New Zealand Treasury. Um, and the interview question I was asked when I was applying for that job was, should New Zealand implement a carbon tax or a carbon price to deal with its emissions? Uh, so that was back in the mid 90s and they're still grappling with those questions today. So it's a good marker of um, how much there is to do as well as I think, you know, we can all reflect on how far we've come. Um, but after that, um, I worked as an economic consultant, first based out of the UK, uh, doing a lot of work on water and sanitation reform in West Africa and the Caribbean and some of the um, reforming economies of Eastern Europe, um, which was a great way to see some grapple with some of the issues that are really on the ground. Um, and then I went back and did a Master's of Science in Economics at the London School of Economics. And uh, when I was wondering what to do then, a company, some colleagues from an Australian company that I'd worked with in West Africa rang up and said, come work with us in Australia. We're doing all this great work. So I moved to Australia and spent several years working on restructuring the electricity sector in New South Wales. Um, and that culminated in uh, helping to design the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Trading Scheme, which was one of the first mandatory emissions trading schemes in the world. Um, and it was just fantastic to be able to be part of that. I think climate change has always been something I wanted to work on and life then throws up different opportunities and you come and go from that. So after that, I, I went away again for a little while. I um, had done a lot of work over time on market design and um, I ended up doing a lot of work in telecommunications and in particular on radio frequency spectrum at designing auctions and pricing um, radio frequency spectrum, including about five years working as the principal economist for the regulator on high value spectrum auctions. Um, and then the Gillard government put through this amazing package of climate policies in about 2011. And I got lured back into that space by colleagues I'd worked on on the greenhouse gas emissions trading scheme and others. And I took on two roles. So the first was working on the expert panel for the federal government that was helping to create rules for carbon credits. So at that time that was under the carbon farming initiative. And um, secondly, um, I took on a role as one of the general managers at the Climate Change Authority, which was a newly established independent statutory authority that had been set up to advise on Australia's targets and policies. Um, so that was all absolutely fascinating work. They were new policy areas, often without much precedent, lots of creativity and rigor and courage and stacks of compromise required um, and lots of new subject matter and engagement with people all over the world. Um, and then in about 2018, I joined the University of Melbourne as managing director of a large collaborative initiative involving seven universities in Australia and six in Germany that 
uh, took on this very wide-ranging program around climate mitigation and energy transition, involving lots and lots of researchers from all sorts of disciplines, I think up to 100 across the life of the group. Um, and then in 2020, I think it was, three colleagues uh, from the University of Melbourne and I set up Climate Resource, um, and that's where I am now, CEO of Climate Resource. Um, and we um, have a much narrower focus than a lot of my prior work. We help organisations, so business, governments, NGOs, multilateral organisations, um, access and make good use of climate science data and models, essentially. So we build software products to help with that, and we provide advice so the implications of those tools are, are understood. Um, so I suppose I've gone up into sort of high level policy and then done stuff that's much more sort of on the ground and detailed and client responsive, but that's where I am now, but more in a climate science translation space. Um, so the things I, I love about what I do, this really echoes what Liz and Michael were saying. Um, I work with absolutely brilliant scientists, software engineers, policy people, and that's across our colleagues and our clients and our collaborators, collaborators, including a whole bunch of people at the University of Melbourne and Melbourne Climate Futures. Um, so I completely agree there are just great people, people working in this space and it's really inspiring. Um, everyone I work with, I would say, is totally focused on getting to net zero um, as fast as we can and uh, a more climate resilient future. And I think the other thing about my particular job is that we're really niche and we're really good at those niche areas. And I feel like our expertise is helping to fill some important information gaps. So we sit behind a lot of people that are, have a lot of clients, um, but we um, happily occupy this really niche role that hopefully is useful. Um, and what do I find hard? I think this also echoes Liz and Michael, which is interesting. Um, I think it's partly about the urgency of the issue and the difficulty of not being able to address everything. So in, in our space, some of those data and information gaps are hard to fill. Sometimes science is slower than you want it to be to have really good answers and you're either left with not having an answer or having a suboptimal answer that, you know, isn't really getting as far as you want to go. And of course, we needed all those information gaps and all that climate action yesterday. So you have to find a way to, um, to resolve that and um, still feel very, you know, of what you do is empowering and important. That's, um, a, great, that's a great comment, Rebecca, because it is that there's a real tension there, isn't there? Like, especially when you've been in the game for a little while or for a long while you know it's like wow and after some wake i'm like are we, are we still doing this we're we still having this conversation around some certain things so it's a real tension to 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 know that you actually we are pushing it in the right way and doing it um thank you everyone uh, so we've got a we've got a good group of people online who are watching uh so we've got um some really great people online i can see you all there so i'm glad you're here please um, put some questions into the Q&A uh, chat uh, and we'll go through them. So yeah, we're going to have a bit of a facilitated discussion now and then we'll go through Q&A. So please put your questions in as you are uh, thinking about them and as we as we have the conversation. So I'd like to start with, um, and I think we'll go to, I'd love to hit Liz on this one. We are, all three of these, your organizations are working with a number of different clients trying to solve this problem in different ways. Um, but there are real thorny issues that, you know, we see ESG everywhere, we see climate change everywhere. Everyone thinks, oh yeah, it's getting solved. It's, it's, it's okay. Like people have got it in hand, but I don't, I'm not sure that's really the case, right? So, because a lot of clients are coming to us with a lot of work, right? So what is the thorny issue? What is the thing that is keeping your clients up at night? Um, Liz, can you give us a few thoughts on that to kick off? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Adam. Um, maybe I'll just give a couple of, of thoughts. We could. There's a very long list, but um, uh, I think probably materially, um, the I think a lot of uh, our industrial or, or um, a large sort of commercial clients made um, quite ambitious announcements around targets in the past few years, and and many of those kind of before um, the federal government announced its own um, emissions reduction target. Um, uh, and and yeah, I think those companies were were ambitious and you know excited and confident. Um, and I would say that now what we're seeing is the the devil in the detail. So 
um, clients are now coming to us saying, like, you know, we've announced this target, but like we we need help to actually make the the plan, like the next lay down of what activities do we need to take, um, what actions do we need to take, you know, if we are to, for example, um, electrify our fuel load, and, and this is probably relevant for our, our mining and um, and other uh, other clients that, that use a lot of um, fuel. Um, you know, is it just as simple as going out and kind of um, trying to find green power purchase agreements, or do we actually need to think about the technology, the infrastructure, the the back end, um, and the you know the the fleet in terms of the you know, do we need to purchase electric vehicles or electric um, machinery to actually be able to unlock those green electrons to supply um, operations? So, is it um, off the shelf, Liz? Is this stuff? Can they just go and say, "Oh, marketplace, I'm going to buy that PPA and buy this bit of tech and stick it together"? Off, off we go. Job done. Uh, I would say no. It's mm. like I mean, the solutions exist, but they are. I think we're still in a space where they'll usually be bespoke in some kind of way. Um, like there's no kind of template contract for um, going out to um, to, sec uh, to secure these types of, um, of power supply agreements. Like they're so varied and nuanced and different for each client and each type of, of need. Um, and I think, again, with the electric vehicles and, and trucks, like, it's a hot like yeah you can't just kind of put your order in and they turn up the next year it's like it's it's complex and and difficult and there's yeah not that many suppliers and um you know and people are looking at huge volumes um and huge volumes in context where we've got real supply chain issues as well and, and you know rising input costs so um yeah, I think that's that's where we're, we're kind of starting to deal with the the reality of the the targets now. I think is where we're we're at. So it feels like a crunch point. Like it's it's the the, re, also the reality is kind of hitting home for these companies. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah, right. Okay. There's, so it's easy to make the target. It's not so easy to actually do the stuff on the ground. To make yes. It. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Liz. Rebecca. Like maybe I'll throw to you just quickly from that one. I mean, you're working a lot with with climate so you have climate scientists and you got you're looking looking a lot with data we're looking you know we just saw the the latest report from the wmo on you know 1.5 within the next three to four years you know what is the challenge you're finding for those companies what are they kind of super worried about um yeah so uh that's such a good question again i think it as liz said it's a really long list um, so there's the, the issues on the transition side. So how do we transition to a lower emission future? And I totally agree with what Liz said, that it's, it's often really hard for some companies. Um, some of it is fuel switching and um, known technologies, even if unknown implementation. Some of it is um, uh, not known technologies, and they might be core things which are integral to production processes and hard to take the first step. And then there's the physical risk side. Um, which is about actually and um, getting better information about what the change in climate might be and what your exposure and vulnerability to that change in climate might be. On, on the data side, where um, and I should say that is really hard as well. Um, there's a lot of unknowns and that it's hard to chart a course through that. Um, on the data side, on the transition side, where we sit at the moment, um, we do a few things. Um, one key thing we do is... Um, we work with organizations, uh, consulting groups, or organizations like the International Energy Agency, who model how key sectors might transition to zero emissions over time. They typically, um, those, so those modeled pathways are very important in helping shape policy and investment decisions. Um, those groups uh, typically model just um, some gases, so mostly CO2 and maybe methane from fossil fuels. Um, we um, take their um, modeled emissions and build bespoke software that maps those to the climate science um, scenarios that infill, that supply all the other emissions and aerosols that are important to determine global mean temperature rise. And then we run it through a climate model using this um, or enable them to do it through their software. So they can see if that scenario is a 1.5 degree scenario or 1.8 or 2 degrees. So they get a sense of how much they need to change um, or what might be required in order to change the pathway to be consistent with Paris Agreement goals. So we sit in the background of a lot of that work. So when the IA comes out with a 1.5 degree scenario, um, that's our climate models and our work in the background that's helping them. Um, 
and we invariably then also get uh, um, so that so that's one thing we, thing we do um, which helps shape where we're going and um, another sort of data related thing that we're doing that is interesting because it's changing so rapidly is we um, do a lot of work to help quantify the impact of country emission reduction targets uh, and what that will mean for what the world's looking at in terms of global mean temperature rise. So that's been important for a long time for international climate negotiations, but now financial um, institutions who have done exactly what Liz said and set themselves ambitious goals to reduce the emissions associated with their portfolios need to grapple with what that actually means for how they reshape their investment, their portfolio allocation. And as they begin to look at their, particularly investors in sovereign debt, want to understand countries uh, emissions pathways, uh, and particularly those that are not that just their historical ones, but the targets they have set themselves, and what um, that will mean if they meet those commitments. So they have a whole new use of this data, which is around reshaping capital flows, uh, and the frameworks that are emerging um, to track those and um, determine how those investors have to monitor what they're doing uh, is something that we're working on as well as supplying the data and reshaping our software tools so they deliver the data that those investors need as opposed to the data in a form that maybe international climate negotiations have needed. So we're, we're very much in the background, um, but it's really fascinating work. That's really interesting, that whole, um, that whole piece on sovereign debt and uh, liabilities that countries have against their pledges and against where they're going to go forward. Because, of course, when we're looking at the global economic system, there's going to be far-reaching impacts for this for those investors. And, of course, we've seen that with the CDP for 20-odd years, the Carbon Disclosure Project. But the data has been hard, and it's now getting better and better and better. And what you're saying is the models are now feeding into how this is going to affect. And what I wrote down here is, you know, the Task Force on Climate related financial disclosure is a lot on physical risk as well as transitional risk. And so I guess you're seeing a lot of uh, people coming to you from that kind of international space going, we want to get better at doing this so we can help these institutions. Or is it the institutions going, wow, we are really, really worried about this. Is TCFD not enough? Is it, is it, is there more we need to do? Uh, so it's both. Um, I would say both. Uh, it's, we, we tend to work less with uh, individual companies and more with um, consultancies who have a, a large number of clients. Um, on the physical risk side, there is really a lot of work to, still to do on understanding the changing climate hazards. And there's just as much work to do to understand for a company what their exposure is given their assets and you know how vulnerable they might be to those changing um, climate um, impacts. So we are on the climate impact side and a lot of other consulting firms who have much better information about the physical assets that these companies might have and how they compare, you know, the correlation between bits of their supply chain and what they need and where they can substitute one thing for another. That's not what we do. We are very much on the, on the climate impact side. And I would say that we're, um, we still have a mountain of work to do as the academic community in conjunction with data providers to do a good job of that. There's very fiery debates happening about the quality of that information and what's needed in order for it to improve. But all of this is, I suppose, partly by way of saying it's an ecosystem and um, there are a lot of challenges at every part of improving our response and making sure that it's based on good information. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. It's yeah, it's a, a really, and it's a great segue actually to to Michael on this, um, especially on the, you know, contam land and climate change impacts, but also doing the work with, um, you know, large in large organisations who are decommissioning large sites, like they're trying to they're trying to be part of that transition. Can you? What's the thorny issue that that you're hearing at the kind of top end here, Michael? On what's keeping up clients? What's keeping clients awake at night on this? <laughs> Yeah, I guess um, a lot of the organisations that we work for are, are sort of indicating that um, their biggest challenges are really just understanding their their risks, their liabilities, um, and that's even a broader at a broader level than than climate. It's um, the broader ESG space. It's it's governance of organisations. So, um, and and a lot of them don't have the in-house expertise necessarily in an environment where a lot of regulations and legislation are rapidly changing and evolving. 
um, as well as other um, stakeholder inputs that are becoming not not less onerous, they're becoming more more onerous, and 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 more more is required to to support processes, um, environmental aspects of of large scale infrastructure projects, for example, in the approval space, um, are, are often the the time critical factor because they're just so all encompassing. So, um, I, I think. I think our clients are saying that they uh, really, for them, it's about getting access to the right advice, and and that's probably coming from using expert advisors like um, like ourselves, like like Deloitte, like um, uh, a range of other organisations that are out there, but but also around, um, I guess, upping their their in house sustainability teams is sort of what what will. I can't kind of see will will come and actually training their their own internal people around broad concepts uh, in the broader ESG space. I guess um, other otherwise the the real specific challenges that um, that that are being faced are that that um, I think I heard the term devil in the detail around the getting to net zero because of all these commitments that have been made. But what does that actually mean? How how is that going to occur? Um, and and the other thing I think that that has sort of really jumped out in the last year or so is around data and environmental data is is massive. There's huge reams of information that are being collected and and how do we how do we best um, take that data, put it in an environment where it, it, it can be readily accessed, manipulated, and and the whole digital and and the AI evolution is is going to be the kind of in the next year or two the real transformation in in the broader environmental consulting and and um, become a key part of of this transition thanks, thanks michael like that that um i kind of want i want to get through to liz on this one to respond to that because you're absolutely right there's this data issue and that you've been talking about rebecca that's there's this macro data on models that's feeding into these kind of very high level discussions and decisions but there's also getting down onto the ground and the data that is needed to make a commercial decision to get something done today to put you on the right path for this stuff. Do we have, does the data exist? Is there enough? Is there too much? Where is it? And Liz, what are, what are you what are you sort of finding with your clients on that? You know, getting, you mentioned before, getting the kit together to make that decision. Can we even do it right now? Uh, I think we can do some of it. Um, I would say like, for example, on a, a big, a really sort of large scale project that we're looking at um, where we have this intersection between trying to um, electrify like what is a very large diesel load at the moment um, and to make those electrons green. We, we know that we can't actually answer that, that question narrowly at this point. So I guess the way we're approaching it now is to try and reduce the levels of uncertainty in those two bands. Um, and so to kind of um, almost sort of zigzag between how we solve the problem. So, you know, first we try and narrow down what we think the demand might be. And then, you know, we look at, okay, what does that mean for supply? Can we, can we get supply from sort of this band, which has got a lot of uncertainty in it, um, to a slightly narrower band? And then, you know, if we can make that work, then what does that mean for how many vehicles we can purchase? So it is... Um, yeah, it's, it, it, for, for many projects, it, there are very high levels of uncertainty, um, you know, and especially clients ask us to model out to 2050 um, and like we can do it, but I guess we, we know that it's inherently uncertain and I guess and what we try to do is to, um, to help them compare sort of the relativities of different options rather than saying like this is the number, this is what you should target. Um, so it's about helping inform decision making often. Um, but yeah, I would say, yeah, huge amounts of, of uncertainties, which is is complex to deal with. Yeah. What are those uncertainties? I mean, you're, you're working on the energy side. Is it uncertainties in the type of technology that's going to roll out the fastest? Is it uncertainties on um, supply demand curves associated with behavioral aspects? Or what are, what are those? Yeah. yeah, I would say a few examples. So, um, uh, so our, our team recently worked on a um, decarbonisation roadmap for the alumina refining industry. Um, and you might not be aware of this, but alumina refining uses more electricity than the whole state of Tasmania. Um, so it's a huge kind of industrial load. 
a um, lot of it in WA, but also up in, in Queensland as well. Um, and uh, the you know, they use a lot of gas because it's a high heat um, process um, to, to, to do the refining. So I guess for them to, to help um, move that, that energy use from gas to, to green electrons, not only do they need to solve that, that question around where to get that all of that volume from, but um, you know those sort of high heat and steam process technologies. You can't just sort of pull the um, the gas pipe out and plug in a, a, um, a power cord. Like you actually have to fully change all of your kit to something different. Um, and and some of that that doesn't ex necessarily exist yet, or there is sort of you know it's in trial and sort of early commercialization phase. So. Um, you know, as I was saying before, you can't sort of just go and, and pull it off the shelf. Um, so I guess, yeah, that uncertainty into when that technology will become available and, and hence sort of unlock your ability to, to change your energy use. Um, there's uncertainty around that. Um, I think for, like, for our some of our large industrial clients, it's like the... Um, it's not just the volume you need, but it's the time of day and, um, and you know, when you're going to be doing different activities. Um, and that can have a huge impact on kind of what your supply or demand um, curve looks like. Um, and you have to kind of account for those peaks. You can't just like, like, you can't just plan for the average because then you're going to have blackouts or not be able to, to run half the time. And that's going to cause you know, huge cost implications so it's so um, dynamic yeah, yeah and shifting yeah. um yeah great okay so there's uncertainties maybe I'll, I'll whiz to you michael before we go to rebecca on this because i'm i'm interested to hear what you're what you're hearing about what's making your clients nervous about uncertainties here i mean you're dealing with large amounts of contaminated land and then decontaminated land and like testing on this and then how does that sit within the uncertainties you know for example the closure of fossil fuel plants what are the what are the challenges you're finding there, and what are the, the bits that are exciting you around that kind of um, that next phase? Yeah, I, I guess we deal with um, companies who have who have either either um, legacy issues or or assets which which need to change, um, and that might include you know remediating land or improving in environmental outcomes associated with those assets. So. Um, I guess that's that's part of the broader transition to um, sustainable solutions, and uh, in some cases, nature-based solutions as well. Um, but again, I also sort of would highlight that there's a huge amount of regulatory uh, evolution and licensing, permitting, um, approvals. So we help we help organisations manage manage risks around their their internal management systems. Um, and um, that might involve, you know, in, embedding people into their teams or or helping to improve their broader environmental processes and and procedures. So um, there are there are two sort of sides. One is the the the, the dealing with the legacy issues, and um, you know we're working on on quite a few um, old coal coal fired power stations, etc. At the moment, that that um, are being cleaned up, and and ho hopefully that. The um, the outcome is that, um, that not only that um, there's a transition around reduction of um, fossil fuel emissions, but actually that the land and and the the infrastructure and the the communities that support those uh, former assets that 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 is actually transitioned into into something that is that is a better um, outcome for for those regions, and um, that's kind of kind of cool to be part of part of that those changes that go on it's not just the numbers on the co2 it's much bigger than that yeah yeah very cool thank you um i want to move to a little bit around what do you need to make this work and, and i'd love to hear from rebecca on this like what, what are the skills you need to get into this i mean you're dealing with sovereign debt funds you're dealing with a whole bunch of complicated stuff here i'm imagining you've got some amazing quant people but is it all quant like who do you, who do you need what kind of skills do you need to make this work are you specific um us specifically. So no, we, we do have um, uh, climate scientists and software engineers and policy people. We absolutely need those quant skills, but we also need um, a range of other skills. And I think even looking at the three of us on 
the panel, Michael, Liz and I, we all come from very different backgrounds. Uh, we're working on different things, but there are um, so many ways into working on climate related issues, I'd say from almost any discipline. In fact, that was really evident at the um, uh, research initiative I was talking about earlier at the Energy Transition Hub. There are people from social sciences and public policy and health and law and just like pretty much every discipline you can imagine, the arts. Um, and at Climate Resource, we absolutely need um, policy people. We need people with exposure to different sectors so we better understand end users' needs. Um, in fact, one of the key things I think is a capacity for people from different disciplines to listen and hear and understand what it is that someone else is meaning and communicating mm -hmm. and concerned about. Um, that cross-disciplinary capacity, it's amazing how easy it is for people in closely related areas to not hear each other and to be answering their own question as opposed to the one that the other person is asking. Um, so, you know, I don't think it's it's definitely not just quantitative skills or even any particular type of quantitative skill. It's a that's a great point. Um, you, you've all touched on this, right? There's so many different disciplines that have to come together to solve it because it's not just one. There's no silver bullet. It's like a quiver of silver arrows. You got to fire at this thing. So, so translation skills are really important. Um, what do you? So maybe to to Liz as quickly on this. What do you, what do you think about? You know, there's this. What are the what are the top? Okay, maybe give me the top kind of technical skills that you're looking for. Top three technical skills, and what is the what is the emotional intelligence skill you're looking for in, in people to come in? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I think we, in terms of technical, um, uh, if they have you know experience in in energy markets, great. But I think uh, like because there's such high demand for those skills. We are looking at people with like ancillary or similar type skills that could be used and applied in different markets. So um, I just dropped in the chat. We actually have quite a few um, chemical engineers working with us who are good at like optimization type models because because that's something we, we do in the energy market regularly. So I guess it's yeah, it's not just sort of the like your your field, but your ability to apply um, types of skills to maybe a, a new market. Um, I think, yeah, people who people who are sort of interested and passionate about change and driving change, and and that can that can be from you know you can come from a financial or accounting or arts background, like kind of, kind of background as Rebecca mentioned. But it's about like I guess being able to to analyze and and help provide recommendations and solutions that will like I guess be be ambitious but also pragmatic to an extent um i think that's often the often the challenge is to to be you know to come up with sort of practical achievable solutions um and then i guess yeah in terms of eq um there's a bit of a theme here but i guess it's about being able to to respond and be be flexible in a in a changing environment um and and also to you know to to really um understand that you know I guess, like for example, in our team, we have a, um, you know, we've had quite a few new staff join, and and we want people who are really um, willing to sort of spend time in training and upskilling new team members, um, you know, helping them feel comfortable and that they can ask what they might feel is a is a silly question, um, but you know, to understand that like nobody knows everything about this market or about um, about climate and we're all learning together and we have to kind of support each other and make time for each other um, to, to be successful as a team. So uh, I guess that would be my, that's, yeah, yeah. Something I'm always looking for. That, that ability for, for people to come in and, and be open to understanding where they need to take it, not just rigid in their approach of disciplines, as you said. Yeah, great. Um, Michael, what are, you, what are your thoughts on this from a, you know, running a, running a, a a business that has got some pretty intense environmental scientists and then you know a bunch of other people doing different things from different backgrounds how is you know diversity is a huge thing for how we're going to deal with this problem what are, what are your thoughts on this and actually kind of people you're looking for to come in absolutely um uh, like we 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 do have lots of scientists and engineers but we also have planners and lawyers and 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 arts graduates and and a bunch of different people um i think um the, partially because the the clients we work with the the sites that we deal with um the problems that we deal with are actually diverse you need a, a array of diverse people um there to support that and 
um, when it comes to the skills that you learn from university, um, be it, you know, creative or critical thinking, you know, having an eye for detail. Um, for me, it was the ability to kind of visualize in three dimensions was a big change in my, in my, in my university um, formative years. And, and ultimately, I think um, going forward, that ability within a team to independently access the bunch of, uh, bunch of information in a self-motivated manner scan sort of all these data sets and then come up with with um and that might be very technically complex but then to come up with um a risk-based or a or a solution that that you then communicate so th just if that's the that's the challenge um having teams of people that bring in different elements around that challenge is really important that's thank thanks michael so it's a real um it's about the outcome at the end. And you mentioned this in your in your remarks previously about the outcome at the end. You have to have diversity in that team to make that happen because you can't, it's not just an engineering problem we're dealing with. It, there's so much more. All right, cool. This has been really helpful. I'm, I think we're going to go to the questions. We've got some great questions coming in. I can see Liz is also answering them as we go through, which is awesome. Thank you. So look, there's a few things here. Um, I'll start with the net zero authority. So the net zero authority was released in the, the this federal budget. Um, what do you what do you think? Any opinions on this? Will it be a policing model or proactively working with business to fa facilitate the country goals? Any any comments on the net zero authority? Feel free to jump in. Anyone we can unmute and just free for all it. Uh, happy to quickly go first, Adam. I, I think it's very early, very hard to tell. Um, I yeah, it's not really sure exactly what they'll be doing just yet. I mean, it sounds good conceptually. I do think we need much more kind of centralised coordination for these um, issues. Um, so, I mean, it sounds good in theory. Is it a messaging thing? Like, I mean, it's there's a lot of this is, you know, we've, is it important that there is a net zero, it's actually stated and it has a place? Or is that kind of making it problematic because it's saying, don't worry, those guys will hold on to it. Like the early days of CSR when the CSR person had to work from the broom closet. Um. Hard to hard to know. Um, I think it it sends an important message, and I would say, like compared to other countries, my view is that like we've got this twenty fifty goal, but the steps in between are currently like, really unclear, and it's not like not really much sort of tangible planning around that. Um, so I think if we can like focus on filling some of those gaps, that would be good. Um, yeah, I guess I do, you do always worry when you kind of centralise this sort of thing that, you know, they will just really be sort of demanding um, outcomes from the agencies who have historically been responsible for that, that policy work and, you know, and that can cause tensions and, and issues. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm not clear on whether the, the idea will be to sort of bring those agencies into that authority or you know how that's going to work but be interested in Rebecca's view um just with her previous role um in government um yeah I, I um agree with what you said Liz it's it's quite hard to see yet it hasn't yet been sort of established it's not up and running but um I do think that it's a model that um mirrors some of the things we've seen in other jurisdictions where um and it has a, a big framing around helping facilitate transitions for transition of workers and regions um mm -hmm. that's been a really big focus overseas and in australia it's really rested with a lot of local and state governments and um it's a it's a big deal to make sure that um the costs of the transition are not born disproportionately by people who have worked in industries which we're going to be transitioning away from and that uh, they have a lot of skills that will be important in the new um, zero emissions economy so I think that focus is, is overdue at a federal government level and it seems to be one of the focuses on the net zero authority and really welcome that's absolutely not a punitive policing role that's very much an assisting role and um, the language they're wrapping around it is very much of an assisting, supporting, recognizing that this is an ecosystem, there are supply chain issues, there's a need to think about this, you know, across um, regions and, um, uh, and and to grapple with all of the issues that Liz was talking about in terms of these not being off the off the shelf solutions 
uh, and that it's hard to, for a company to implement something untried and untested, which is a critical part of their operations. It's a big risk and there's a role for government in supporting that. So um, I think that that is the language that's being used at the moment to frame mm -hmm. what its focus will be. And it, it's not um, it's not going out on a limb. It's like Australia in some respects uh, stepping into the role that uh, federal governments have taken in some other jurisdictions, like Germany, for example. Um, mm. so it's not unprecedented. It's it's yeah. it's it's stepping up to do kind of what is best practice internationally uh, in this role. Um, a quick quiz question here: We've had some people asking around. You know, there's lots of jobs for engineers in this. What about other professions, accountants and marketers? I'd probably add in communications. I'd, I'd add in probably creativity in this. Creativity is going to be one of the top skills going forward needed in the workforce. Um, Michael, what are your what are your thoughts on this in that in that sort of the alternative sense of people coming into work on it? Yeah, I I I, I think um, there there will always be sort of technical elements which require training and capability to answer um, those technical aspects that that. Um, that really flow through to to the deliverable, but there are constant inputs from different areas. So, like I said before, you know, we have we have a range of um, um, different um, disciplines that feed into that process. I think um, there over over the last few years there has been a, a definite input into you know from from marketers and from um people preparing ESG reports and publishing them and so having that experience and knowledge enabled to do that has been where it's possibly gone wrong is where the balance has been too much on that um in that direction and then that sort of led down to the to the greenwashing areas and 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 whatnot um rather than necessarily having engineers and scientists involved so I think um there's, I can't see how there's not going to be a, a combination of of different disciplines and and people contributing to this going forward. Mm, that's a really great call, actually, and really interesting point on um, the kind of how we communicate this. And we, I think you're right. We've gone, we swayed really far one way on like pledges and where we're going to go, and it's going to be incredible and amazing. And then getting back down, this is what we first talked about: the game to the actual nuts and bolts of how we do it. It's really really tough. So. Um, it seems like there's a, a that balance part is coming up again, but I'm also wondering about, and we talked a bit about this in our pre-calls about burnout and you know what people how people are, are feeling about this and, and where they're going. Um, and I think one of the things that I would love to ex explore a bit here is one of the questions here around um your supply chains and burnout of not being able to get it done. For example, you mentioned this, Liz, before, like so Jane has talked about here, there's 100 percent renewable energy and electric vehicles by 25 or 2030. Um, but there's not enough supply in there. How do we, there's a technical aspect there about getting supply chains right, but there's also like, this is, this is, is this the too hard bucket for some people? And it's like, you know what, I'm leaving, I'm going back to just straight up finance, you know? Yeah, as in, as in people working in our team? You mean? Yeah, people are working with, yeah. or like, is there a, bur is there a, I know there's lots of energy now because people are hiring a lot yeah. of people, but is there a burnout that there's a risk that the actual way the world is working, the supply chains mm -hmm. are, really bad right now that's going to lead to people going you know what i'm actually going to flip the other way screw it i'm just going somewhere else as in yeah normal. yeah i think um there's probably yeah i think uh in working in this space there is like there is so much so much work the challenge is so huge that um we as professionals have to really proactively manage our time so that we are we can be as effective as possible in a day um, and you know it would be possible to work like 24 hours a day if you know if that was physically and mentally possible which we know it's not so I, I guess something I work with with our, our staff is like you know trying to work out sort of what your boundaries are like what what is an achievable day for you that actually you know means you can um, get your work done but also not be like feeling that you have to work sort of really crazy long hours um, because yeah, it is it is a risk and it, it is possible. So we have to be like be laser sharp focused on ensuring that that doesn't happen. Um, that's also about sort of setting up teams correctly so that you know you've got enough people with the right skills working on any particular issue, so that you're not sort of just leaving like all of the the hard work for one person who has that particular skill set. Um, and and that's a, so that's a challenge in in recruitment as well. 
Um, mm. I think on the the supply chains question, um, are they going to be able to meet? Are they going to be able to meet these the targets like supply? Uh, it, yeah, it's a really it's a good question, and um, I th I think it's going to be really hard for those kind of mid level supply chains, um, perhaps who don't have the sophistication or the buying power, um, or maybe the people power that someone like a you know BHP or RIA or you know one of the, like your large huge companies who who are in, starting to think about how can I help achieve my emissions reduction target by actually putting some of that obligation on my contractors. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I do worry that that sort of mid bracket in particular, like, you know, just the, co the cost of doing that and the complexity, um, it, it might become overwhelming. Um, mm. and, and I think, you know, for example, those large companies, I think they have an obligation to really like proactively work with their suppliers to make sure that that they're not being unrealistic and that you know maybe they have a capacity building obligation as well mm, um interesting because not just taking the benefit of that emissions reduction um but you know actually like working together to to achieve it i think yeah that's a great point um any comments on that kind of mid lesson that mid-level group of organizations yeah any comments on that michael yeah, I, I like we we um, assess particularly our scope three emissions. Like we're we're an organisation of about one hundred and fifty people um, around around the country, but we have thousands of suppliers. Um, so we're not we're not that big, but but you go into the scope three, and it's really problem you know problematic information. What's going on? Um, and I think. That it's slowly evolving and changing, but if you if you're trying to have conversations with your with your supply chain about electrification or hydrogenization of equipment, and et cetera, um, the, the variance in knowledge and awareness is, is radically different. But I, I kind of envisage that in a few years, there'll be a tipping point mm. is actually understanding what their emissions profile is. And then that then the information's readily accessible and then it flows through the rest of the, the um, supply chain. So I, I kind of think, um, I'm not sure when that will be, but maybe maybe that's that's um, a function of regulation, both federal and state, as well as as well as well um, industry-led initiatives. But I feel that that's, that's coming, that there will be a tipping point. Mm, for those, for those mid-level companies who still need some capacity, that they're going to start reaching that tipping point as well. We'll be able to help them through that. But before we're running a little bit short on time, but I want to ask Rebecca on this one. We've had a question come in here, which is on AI. Um, and what are the opportunities to use AI to help companies transition? And I think this, you know, relates to what are the opportunities of AI and data manipulation and, and data processing that you, you're working on? Uh, um. AI is the topic of the day, isn't it? I, I actually, I, I genuinely don't know at the moment. It's hard to imagine it won't play a big role, but exactly how that takes shape, I, I just think it's wide open right now. Um, and I think um, one of the big issues we already grapple with is not the existence of vast quantities of data, but the quality of the data and the usefulness of it in supporting good decision-making. And I think it really remains to be seen how good AI is at cracking and assisting with that, because there is enormously large quantities of data and um, there is real expertise in understanding the construction of the data and what is appropriate and in um, sensibly framing this conversation around uncertainty so that people are making the appropriate trade-offs. Uh, so I, yeah, I'm sure it has a role, but exactly how that will play out, I, I think I really have no idea at the moment. It's going to be interesting to see. Um, okay, thank you, Rebecca. That's a great answer because the thing is, there's you know we don't know what that looks like, but I think one thing we do know, and before we wrap this up, is we've got to hit... Um, 50 percent. Well, we've got to pretty much hit 50 percent reductions by 2030. We're going to be in 1.5 degrees probably within the next four years. Um, but we have all this movement and potential and expertise. I mean, within the three of you in this room and the organizations you represent, there is so much capacity to do great stuff. So what is your one word to sum up what you feel about where we're going to go in the next six and a half years? 
So um, maybe I'll start. Rebecca, your last thoughts. What's your one word that would, would sum up how you feel about we're going the next six and a half years? Fast. Fast. Brilliant. That's my time. Fast. Brilliant. Um, cool. Uh, Michael? Um, can I add an adjective? Cautiously <laughs> optimistic. <laughs> say, say it again. Cautiously optimistic. Cautiously optimistic. Okay, great. We'll uh, we'll put it in a sentence where there's a hyphen. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Liz. Uh, I think wobbly um, because I think it's going to be be fast, and we need to be optimistic, but also it's going to be you know it's not going to be smooth sailing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you. So fast to 2030, consciously optimistic to 2030, and wobbly to 2030. I think that sums it up very, very well. Thank you, all three of you, for being here. Thank you, everyone, for the questions online. Please uh, reach out to Melbourne Climate Futures Academy. Please reach out to Liz, Rebecca, and, and Michael, uh, or, or if you're happy to share details, we can, uh, MCF can organize that, but please reach out to us. Thank you all for joining. Thank you for all the questions, and thank you. We'll give a nice big virtual round of applause for our uh, panelists for being such a great sports here today. So thank you, Liz. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Michael. Really appreciate it. And uh, see you all soon. Thanks, you guys.